Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to AM Insights. We welcome our live COVID safe audience. We welcome people watching at home via live stream and those watching us later on catch up. Before we begin, we acknowledge and pay our respects to the traditional owners of country throughout Australia. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Tonight, we are coming to you live from Gadigal land. Tonight, we shine a light on entrepreneurship, the art of taking an idea and turning it into a profitable global business. And who better to talk to us about that than Jackie Shaw, co-founder and CEO of Jackster. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you, Ed. It's exciting so, to be here. <laughs> I guess we should begin by getting you, like all good entrepreneurs, to give your elevator pitch on what is Jackster. Jackster is, if you know IMDB, we are the IMDB for music, but we are the world's first public-facing database of official music credits, and we are the largest public-facing database of official music credits in the world which is pretty incredible when you consider our offices on the corner of Crown and Oxford Street in Darlinghurst. Yeah. That's a pretty big achievement for us and for the industry, I think. It is a big achievement. And I'll, I'll, we'll, I'd like to talk more about JAXA, but I want to go back now and find out how you got into all of this, how you started in the business. So okay. what was your very first entry point? Uh, I volunteered to work at Channel 9 for work experience when I was in year 10 and I serendipitously met Richard Wilkins at the first ever National World AIDS Day. At Pitt Street Mall there was a store called HMV and he was signing autographs and I wanted to get my mum who's in the audience um, a signed uh, booklet of Frank Sinatra and I thought now's my time, now's, now's my time. So Mr Wilkins I I, I love MTV, is there any chance I could come and do work experience? And he completely blew me away and gave me his business card. So of course I called and then four weeks later I was doing work experience at MTV, which then led to me going to Channel 9 every single school holidays for the rest of my um, high school years. And then that led to me getting a job at Fox Studios, which led to me getting work in film production, which led to me then doing music videos, which led to me working at Channel 9. So, and EMI. Yeah. Yeah. So, because you know, a lot of people talk about uh, to, uh, talk about uh, internships these days, mm -hmm. and some people think that they're a bad idea and feel like they're exploitative. What was it about that experience that set you up for a career in, in the music business? There is nothing like on-the-job learning and training. It's all of the little things that you pick up on in an office culture that give you preparation and training for when you go out into the real world. Education is absolutely critical, but whilst you are being educated, you have to be in the workforce learning how the processes work in the industry. There are things that you would never get to learn unless you're in the office speaking to people in the office and overhearing conversations. It's even down to language, you know, what, you, what language you should use, what you shouldn't use and, and watching interactions and the things that you pick up by osmosis by being in the room with other people. And I, I started, I mean, I must have driven them insane at MTV because they would give me a task and I was like the energizer bunny. They'd be like, can you take this tape up to the library? And I honestly think they did it to get me out of the office and I would zip up to the library and I'd zip back like a puppy dog, what can I do next? And they'd be like, can you take this tape to the library <laughs> and run up and come back? I stacked the photocopy machine 100 times a day, made 400 coffees, got everybody lunch, anything. And I'll never forget Mike Dalton, who's an incredible journalist. <laughs> he took me into a room and he said, see all of these tapes and CDs? Yes, Jack. Yeah, and he said, okay, I want all of them in alphabetical and genre order. And I think they thought, great, this will shut her up for three days. I yeah. had it done within like five hours. Yeah. Like a puppy dog came back out, what's next? And they were like, you've seriously done that? Yeah, because I just wanted to learn. And I never forget, there was a D-Pro for Celine Dion. And I, I played it and I listened to it and I came out and I said, oh my God, this woman has the most incredible voice. But she hadn't had any sort of showcase or anything in Australia yet, so she was unknown. And then literally 18 months later, she exploded. And I remember having that moment of going, 
oh my God, I got to hear that before anybody else. How yeah. cool. Yeah. So you were, the, you were the intern from hell. I mean, you were... I was. But... Yeah, I was. I drove everyone crazy. But I, I mean, sorry for sort of staying with this topic for a while because I think it is actually really interesting to it's students. Important. But this, this thing, I mean, what do you think it was about your your work as an intern that made them invite you back? I mean, was it that you were so enthusiastic? Was it that you kept wanting to learn? What I think was it? it was that I, I would do anything. So I wanted to learn everything I could possibly learn about Channel 9, about how they worked, about NTV, about um, how Richard did his research for stories, how Mike Dalton researched the stories that he was producing, how Bronwyn, uh, you know, the, the production manager of the show, who had the most enormous workload on her shoulders, how they did it all, how they recorded the show. And so much of my learnings were through osmosis by being in the room, by being privy to listen to those conversations. And, you know, until, until you know you've earned the right to speak in that room, literally just shutting up, being silent and listening mm. and learning and listening and learning and listening and learning. And then once you've done that for a while, they have you back because they know that you know what the ground rules are. And, and they can, they can trust you to, to do the job, yeah. They can trust you to do the job. So, and, and at that point, did you have any idea of what you would end up <laughs> doing as a career? No, <laughs> no. But you knew you wanted to work in the entertainment business. I knew I, I, I knew I wanted to work in either television or film. And I just laugh because if we had met 10 years ago and you had said to me, hey, Jack, you're going to end up running a metadata company. Yeah. With all due respect to you, Ed, and I have tremendous respect for you, I probably would have shoved you and gone, oh, please. <laughs> and now I'm running a metadata company. So, there you go. Yeah. Exactly. But I knew it would be in entertainment. And it was through my experience of being behind the scenes in television and film production where I learnt firsthand how important credits are because you don't get your next gig without them. So this is the funny thing because if you look at after you left the interning and, and actually got paid roles and, yes. and you worked with Baz Luhrmann and you worked at EMI, yeah. it, it's as if all of these jobs were a preparation for starting Jackster because they were all behind the scenes jobs where you realise the, the value of that information. Uh, uh, it's like you were doing a training program. I was. It was like it was um, an MBA. And I, I still feel this, the, the, the learning curve in life is always so steep and I never stop learning all the time, particularly when you're working in tech and in music. It's just it's a never-ending stream of more information and acronym soup and there's so much to take in and obviously we're a publicly listed company as well so that adds its own level of, of dynamics and intricacies to it so yeah you never stop learning but you're absolutely right from back to my volunteering days I mean I, I volunteered for six and a half years across the industry before I got my first paid job Wow. Uh, so I had quite a CV by the time I got my first paid job by which time I got my first paid job, I have to say I did have a little bit of like, oh, it's about time. <laughs> you know, I'd say, I remember trying to get a job in film in the beginning and I sent 150 letters. I got a, a copy of the Encore production book and I wrote to every single production company in Australia, I will work for free. I will do anything and everything. And I had maybe three companies write back to me. But then, you know, I ended up at Fox Studios Australia and I ended up working for George Lucas, so, you know, I got there in the end. Took yeah, you some work, did. though. So, at, at what point did you conceive of the idea of starting your own business? There were, there were, there were, some, there were some trials and, and failures, which I ended up learning from back in the film production days. So a very, very beloved dear friend of mine, Josh Pomerantz and I started a production company and we did some music videos and uh, a short film which actually won some awards, which was really cool. And we started that and we had these big grand dreams of it becoming you know, a powerhouse production company. We're gonna pump all of these films through the Australian film industry. And for one reason or another, we never got there, but I learnt a lot just going through that process with Josh, who was an established businessman at the time, working with his um, father, the late great Hans Pomerantz, uh, running their company, Spectrum Films. So I learned a lot again on the ground and then had other iterations where I was sort of going into film production and then worked with a, another beloved dear friend, Jamie Hilton, who's now a prolific film producer. 
and he was doing a phenomenal number of music videos. So I was uh, effectively line producing those with him and that's how I got headhunted to go and work at EMI. Uh, but it, it was interesting, I think because both of my parents were business owners, it was never an unknown to me that I could maybe one day run my own business. And with the concept of Jackstar, I was so driven by watching at the front lines what was happening to my beloved husband and our friends and colleagues who weren't being credited properly at the time and therefore missing out on opportunities, that it really became a driving force and a mission for me. And I finally kind of found my calling, which coincided with the loss of my beloved father. And when that happened, I really, I needed Jackster to funnel my grief. I needed a mission. I wanted to make both of my parents really proud and I was driven at a level I've never been driven before. And so that really sparked the, the need to create Jackstar, but I never actually thought about what it would entail. And I think there's, that's important because I think if you know what it's going to take, you probably, probably wouldn't do it. I mean, the fantasies I have at least three, four or five times a year of going to work in a cafe, <laughs> you wouldn't believe. <laughs> so your father was a musician? Yeah, he was a, he was a jazz drummer um, in, in, um, in bands back in the day, but he was also a graphic designer. Right. Yeah. So your father was a musician, your husband is a musician. Yes. Uh, there's a pattern there. Yes. Um, <laughs> Is that part of what drove you, the fact that you, you saw how difficult it was for musicians to be credited? Is, is that part of what drove you to, to Jackster eventually? Absolutely. I, I, um, coming from film, again, we had IMDB. Mm. So we had this amazing resource where you can look up the director of photography, the you know, head of makeup, the costume designer, and then transitioning to, to music and working at a label in 2006 which was when Ask Jeeves was the number one search engine in the world. <laughs> and MySpace was ruling our lives. And now we have the cough because of the plane trees outside. Yeah, right. I will hopefully survive the rest of this talk without having a <laughs> cough. <laughs> we've got an we've got a <coughs> EpiPen if things get really bad. I might need a lozenger. Hopefully <laughs> it'll calm down. But it was, it was witnessing the decline of music credits in 2006 because we had, you know, iPods coming out and if anyone remembers iPods, they had the smallest screen in the history of the world and really what they wanted to be able to show was the artist's name and the track title. They had no capacity to show the beautiful rich liner notes of everybody that was behind the recording. Even the cover art. Exactly, not even the cover art. Mm. And so iPods were the most exciting thing because all of a sudden you had a thousand songs in your pocket. Like, oh my God, that's incredible. But with that incredible groundbreaking, you know, technological advancement, we all of a sudden made hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, immediately invisible. Because all of a sudden the songwriter's not credited, the producer's not credited, the mixer, the engineer, the mastering, all of the, all of the session musicians that worked on the recording just evaporated. They became invisible. And no one really saw it as an issue until almost a decade later, when all of a sudden, no one could find that information or that data. And data now, as we know, drives decisions. It's the new oil, as it's been referred to all the time. But also, more importantly for those individuals, it's how they get their next job. And it's often how they get paid. So the fact that these people just seem to disappear was a real issue and it wasn't if I hadn't have worked in the film and television industry where my credits got me my next jobs um, I may not have have had the personal experience to to understand what it means not to be credited because when you don't get your credit it's more than the professional uh, effect that it has in your career it personally hurts because mm. a lot of creatives are sacrificing a lot of their personal time to be in that room. You're missing dinners, anniversaries, weddings, all sorts of events because you've got to be in the recording studio or in the case of a film, you're on location shooting somewhere for months on end. I feel as if 
you know, in the 70s and 80s, credits were respected because we, we had albums and, yeah. you know, you'd pull out the inner sleeve and it had ridiculous amounts of detail, like, you know, on a Steely Dan record, who played the first solo on the song yeah. and then who played the, the second, second solo. <clears throat> and, and I feel like that all disappeared and pop became very kind of bland and anonymous and you, you, a Katy Perry record, you didn't know who played on no. it. It didn't really matter. Uh, it just had her name and her picture on the front and that was it. Um, so I think what you're talking about, in a sense, what, what Jackster's doing is, is trying to bring back the importance of those contributions because mm. there are many and, and, and these days a contemporary pop song can have eight writers and mm. you know x number of arrangers and remixes and everything else so all of those people deserve to be credited absolutely and it's how you can discover music mm. because like with katie perry's teenage dream like one of the geniuses behind that album was the great max martin and for a lot of people in the industry, they know who he is. Mm. But if you're not, and you go and you research who he is and what he's done in his career, your mind will be blown. A whole universe of music will be open up to you. So it's, it's knowing who's behind the music is as important who's front of stage. Because without our front of stage performers, we, we need those brave souls who go out there night on night, day after day, pouring their heart out to the world and performing. But they need the village around them. And that village is their creative team that helps them express what they want to say. And all of those people are, are as important as the person that's at the front of the stage with the light shining on them, getting all of the accolades. You know, it's, they wouldn't be there without their team. And most artists know that. And the other thing is, Arguably, there's no one fighting in the corner of all of those contributors, the session players and writers. I mean, no, no one's yeah. representing their interests or, or saying, you know, what about that credit? It's, it's not, not a big deal. No, and I, and I think one of the things that we, we have to do as an int industry, because this is really incredibly important, is with the generations that are coming through now, they have to fight for their credits. They have to know how important they are and they have to be unafraid to ask for them in the session. Just want to make sure I'm getting my credit on that, mate. Thank you. This is the correct spelling of my name. You know, this is my APRA number, if you, member number if you need it. This is my ISNI, my individual identifier that will follow me for the rest of my life. There are just things that they need to know because in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, there were often engineers in the room who were tracking absolutely everything that every single person was doing and how they were contributing to a release. And now you've got musical geniuses like Flume who will write a song flying from Sydney to New York mm. and program the whole thing on his computer, you know, and, and he's, in that case, he's, he's, he's programming the instruments, but, you know, if he was then to go and record who's a part of that session, that's a lot of responsibility for him to track who was there doing what when. Mm. You know, Louis, my husband who's here, he will often work on tracks and sometimes people work on them in different countries at different time zones and add bits and pieces. But, you know, he's one of the rare few who makes sure he tracks every single person that's involved in a recording, makes sure he triple checks the spelling of their name and then hands all of that to the label. And that's, that's incredibly important for those individuals. So... We've just successfully identified what the problem is. Yes. Jackster is the solution to that problem. Yes. Um, so tell me, it would be very interesting to understand what your process was. You know, having decided this was an important thing and something you wanted to mm. put time and, and effort into, uh, how did you go about <laughs> taking that from a great idea into what it is today, which is a, a, a reality? So I, um, quite frankly, had absolutely no idea what I was doing. So, um, <laughs> I mentioned earlier today, uh, we have a family friend, Dennis, and he found two filing cabinets on the street, and I measured them, and I went to Bunnings, and I bought a piece of plywood, and I painted it, and I put it on top of the two filing cabinets, and that was my desk. And I worked from home for the first two and a half years with my laptop, and I would research every single day. I, I signed up to every industry newsletter you can imagine and created this matrix of articles so I could compare what they'd said here about, you know, um, the decline of physical sales versus, you know, where we're going with, with, with digital and the beginnings of streaming. And I literally got a Word document and, and with, oh my God, I think back on it, like if I was to show you, it's mortifying. <laughs> but it, I literally got the text boxes and I was like, homepage search button, 
artist one, artist two, artist three, artist four, and started to map it out. And then unbeknownst to me, I started to build the wireframes for the product. And Without knowing that that's what they were called. Yeah, I found that out later. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I was intended, yeah, I did wireframes. <laughs> um, but that helped me visualise it, and it helped me go to the industry and ask for the industry's thoughts on the product. Uh, so I had meetings uh, with everybody, and Peter, Peter Carpen's here tonight, like I, I would show this product to anybody that would give me time. And I think back to the introductory emails that I wrote, honestly, Ed, they, they was war and freaking peace. <laughs> they were so long. And now I realise what I should have said is, mate, can I have 20 minutes? And yep. can I show you something? But I, I, was, I was in a fortunate position because of where Louis' career was at the time and having worked at EMI, I was able to get in front of a lot of people locally. And then uh, because Louis was doing songwriting sessions all over the world, I would, I would travel with him and then wherever we were, I would just do whatever I could to get a meeting with anybody and go, this is the idea, what do you think, what does it need, what do you want it to be? And I did 269 of those before we completely settled on what the product would be. So before, before I even know, that's in the, in the tech world, that's called user acceptance testing, mm. um, or BAU, and I had done that unbeknownst, but just made a start. And it was, and it was so hard, honestly, in the beginning, you know, to get, you'd be, you'd be dying to get 20 minutes with somebody, and it would be the one meeting of the week that you'd have, and <laughs> it would be the most exciting thing that happened. And trying not to like verbal diarrhea the moment I said, so Ed, I've got an idea and I just want to show it to you. What do you think about this? And you know, <laughs> trying to get it out in that 20 minutes um, and, and capture information. But people in the industry were incredibly generous and gave, gave me time. And the product wouldn't exist without it. And I, I actually have a Google sheet of every single meeting I have ever taken and who connected me to that person so that I can track how we got, for example, the Grammys. Millie Petriella introduced me to Loretta Munoz from ASCAP, who introduced me to Kelly Purcell at Recording Academy, who introduced me to Maureen Droney at Recording Academy. And between the two of them, after three years of conversations, we had a deal with the Recording Academy. And they introduced me to DDEX, so we became a member of DDEX, who are setting the metadata standards for the music industry. But I've always wanted to be able to track, so we never forget how we got somewhere how we got into the room and we never forget to thank those people. Because mm. it's easy when you're on the treadmill, you can forget sometimes. So as any entrepreneur will agree, there's the process of perfecting the product, but then there's a whole other process which is raising the capital needed to launch a business. Oh, sweet Lord, yes. <laughs> so when did that, pro I mean, presumably that process started a bit later after you'd gotten an idea that you thought could, could fly. Yes, I, th I think back to my first pitch deck song. <laughs> oh, it's also mortifying. Um, but it's, it's so hard because, you know, without innovation labs and incubators, which, you know, when I started my journey, a lot of that actually didn't exist. I mean, I was going to every possible startup grind and, and girls who code and anything I could get my hands on to hear how people were doing it. And I was often one of maybe, particularly, you know, for the, the startup grind events and things that I went to, I, I was often maybe one of three women in the room. And the thing that was terrifying is that everybody was a CTO, a chief technology officer. So they were writing the code base for their product. I didn't know how to write a line of JavaScript. So you can imagine how intimidating that is, walking into these summits and there's 250 people there and you're one of maybe four women and you're not a, a chief technology officer. And that's where I, learned, I started to hear about how important it is to raise money and how you do it and what it takes and you know, getting the right pitch deck. And I was, just, I was fortunate enough to meet two men, um, Leo Lawrence and Colin Seeger, who really properly started me on the fundraising journey and gave me a phenomenal amount of time and assistance and help. And had they not, this, we, would, we would not be where we are now because they gave me all the training that I needed, got me into some incredible rooms, helped me hone my pitch, and, and that was the beginning of it. But, you know, I did hundreds of pitches 
and, and more so since too to get to where we are now to raise capital. And uh, you're constantly refining the craft and constantly refining your pitch decks and the way you present them and how you update the market. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of work. And, and, if you're and if you're like any other entrepreneur that I know, that process never stops. Never. Because until at least you're profitable, and, and I think we can assume Jackster's not yet profitable. Not yet. It will be very you, soon. <laughs> you have to keep raising capital uh, yes. to increase, to, to extend, as they say in the business, your runway. Yes. Because uh, otherwise you'll run out of tarmac yeah. and the plane will go off the edge. Very so true. you don't want that to happen. So, no. so, that, so that even though you're achieving enormous success and growth, you still have to keep raising more money. You, you do. And, you and, know, and telling a story about why this is still a great idea to invest in, even well, though people have invested money in the, in the past. Completely, and that takes uh, consistent maintenance. I mean, um, you know, one of the things that is so bizarre is to go into somebody's office or, a, you know, a meeting room, like when you do what they call road shows, and, and be like, this is what we're presenting and we're here to raise X million dollars uh, at, at, at this price and this is what, you know, this is what you'll get, these are the terms, you know. And it's such a strange thing to meet somebody for this first time and go, oh, hey, hey Ed, can I, uh, can I just hit you up for a call to mil? <laughs> like, who does that? Yeah. So you, it's really important to set up relationships and maintain them. And I'll never forget our brilliant chair, Linda Jenkinson, saying to me, you know what, Jax, nothing ticks me off more than people that only contact me when they want me to invest in their business. I want people that are constantly keeping me up to date and not just prodding me when they want money, but letting me know how things are going and keeping me up to speed on what's happening. And it was such a great piece of advice because we have a long list of people that now want to invest in Jaxter because we've spent years talking to people and keeping them updated and informed of what we're doing. So they've actually been able to see the traction. When we say we're gonna do something and then we achieve it, they're like, okay, well that's good. Versus going in unknown and being like, can I have that call to mill? Mm. It's almost rude if you think about it. Yeah. You've got to take the time to build the relationships. At least buy them a drink. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or a meal, ideally. <laughs> <laughs> so you've raised, I won't get you to name the amount, but you've raised millions of dollars in investment. Mm. You've, you've now got, I mean, the, the, the platform, I should say, I didn't say it earlier, but I should say it now. It's incredible. Thank you. I mean, it's such a great, it's so, so much fun to play with. Because you can yeah. type in people that you've worked with or that you know, and it's like, wow, all their credits come up. Thank you. I have to pass that on to the team too. I don't do it in isolation. And it's a, and it's a beautiful, intuitive platform too. Like it's it looks great. It's it's got a great look and feel. Thank you. So I yeah, should have I should have said those compliments that, forty mate. minutes ago. But anyway, <laughs> um, how many subscribers do you now have? So the beginning of this year was in the hundreds, and we are now we're going to pass eighty thousand this week. Wow. Yeah, it's ex exciting. Do you have a number in mind for what your target is ultimately? I, I want us to get to 100,000 by, you know, first, first couple of months of next year. And then, you know, the long-term goal is that we, we hit around a quarter of a million and then beyond. There's that many creatives working in the music industry and there's a lot that we can, we can build into the product that will make it a, a must need. Like we have our banking apps and we have our Uber app for people that work in the music industry in the future, the Jaxter app will be as important as those apps on their phone. So I want to ask you, I mean, one of the things that happens when you start a business like this is that you, you realise new value in the idea as you go along. Like yeah. the, the original idea sort of pivots and moves and shifts and you go, oh, we can use it for that as well. Mm. So. What learnings did you have? I mean, okay, so it still works in its primary purpose, which is as a database. Mm. But what else does it do? Or did you, did you find things along the way that it was also valuable for? Absolutely. So one of the things that I had to learn in acronym soup in the journey is API, which stands for Applied Program Interface. And that's effectively how computers talk to each other. It's their language. We speak English. Uh, they speak API code. And we found that through all of the data that we were collecting, that there was a way to, to on-sell that data with our partner's permission to drive other platforms, whether it's their back-end or it's their front-facing you know, website, and we could create a whole new revenue stream for the industry, one that hadn't existed previously, as far as we're aware and as far as our partners have told us. So that's been really exciting because we've been working on our commercial API this year 
and uh, we have some, some deals that are being negotiated at the moment in the pipeline and I really feel once we officially launch that to the market, we, we know we're going to be inundated with requests because we're already getting So is that influx. to enable royalty collection? It depends on the client. So we have a media company that wants the API for different purposes. We have a fitness company that's interested in the API presently to help drive how their instructors are going to program the music for their classes. We have uh, obviously DSPs that are interested. There are, it's fascinating, you know, there's a, there's a company that buys uh, music catalogues for publishing purposes and exploitation and there's an application for the API that they're very interested in. So it really, de it really depends. Um, you know, Song Trader want to use it for neighbouring rights, which is fantastic. So, yeah. yeah, and look, you know, when we started Jackster, it was all about credit where credit's due. Again, if you had said to me, hey, Jack, you're going to build an API, I would have been like, don't be silly. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we've, we've found all these different revenue streams uh, as we've gone along and, and different ways that the product can work for the industry and music creators, which is you know, really thrilling. And there'll be more, too, that we haven't even thought of yet. So I've waited until this point in the interview to ask the question that you must get asked all the time. Has all of this been harder because you're a woman? I would say that there are elements of that that are true and elements that I think just being an entrepreneur and starting a business, it's just hard for anyone. But, you know, look, I'm not going to pretend it hasn't been daunting to time after time after time again, 98, I'm going to say 99% of the time I go into a room to raise money, I'm in a room full of men, very few women are in there. and. When you're first starting out and, and learning how to pitch, that's really intimidating and daunting. And, uh, you know, there have also been some things that have happened. Uh, I've never been hurt, but I've had some things said in front of me. Uh, I had a man actually touch my thigh at an, inv at an investor pitch once. Like, there have been some things that have been like, really? Mm. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that hasn't been easy. But... I wouldn't be where I am without the men in the industry who have supported me and lifted me up and encouraged me along the way. So it, it goes both ways. I mean, there are, there are things about this journey that you just need to be mindful of. You know, I, I remember reading a statistic once where, as a woman, when you walk into a room for a meeting, within the first seven seconds of you entering the meeting, People do this without even knowing. They're completely judging whether or not you can do the job based on is your hair immaculate? Are your nails immaculate? Are your shoes scuffed? Is there a mark on your handbag? How, how are the clothes that you're wearing? And I remember reading that and thinking, oh my God. And from that moment on, every investor pitch I ever did, head to toe immaculate. I mean, my mother's always immaculate. Um, this is Glamazon. The apple fell a little far from the tree with me because when I am not here being interviewed, I am in converse jeans, hair in a top knot, and wherever possible, sans makeup. But um, it's a great excuse, though, to spend a lot of money on clothes. It can be fun, <laughs> but uh, but I remember learning that and thinking, okay, this is a game of chess. If I want to win, then let's just remove that that let's just remove that pawn off the table straight away, and then when I walk in. If they're going to judge me on that five minutes into the pitch, then, that, then it's not money we want anyway. So what about being an Australian? Do you think it's harder to be an entrepreneur out of Australia? Oh, my God, no. I actually think it's the biggest benefit in the world. Why? Because people love Aussies. Oh. And I do believe that when people know you've flown across the world to come and meet with them, they'll meet with you. A trip they probably wouldn't be prepared to take themselves. No. No, but when, when, um, when you, you know, when you fly over to meet with people, they'll meet with you and they'll give, they will give you the time of day. And one of the things that I think is really important wherever possible to get a peer introduction. Because if somebody is connecting you, then they're more likely to take the meeting than if you're trying to cold approach them. And I, I mean, in the beginning of Jackster too, and this was incre incredibly expensive for Louis and I, like, you know, we've, we've personally put over two deposits for a house and an apartment into this business. But I remember, you know, getting emails, one from the Grammys actually, oh my God, I thought my life had been made. And they said, oh, 
are you available this week? And I was in Sydney and I'm like, absolutely, how's Thursday? <laughs> and we literally got on a plane and flew over, you know, in economy, sardine can, getting off the plane and going straight to the meeting. And um, You've got the time difference in your favour yeah, on got the way over. I, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and I remember going to the Grammys and they used to, they don't have them anymore, but they used to have their Grammy icon was um, stenciled in the car park. And I remember like sneaking a photo and then I got into reception and there was a photo and I said, oh, look, can I take a photo of that Grammys emblem because this is the coolest, one of the coolest things that have ever happened in my life. And they said, absolutely. And I said, I will never post this. And then I remember another colleague in the industry that was working on a startup, everywhere this person went, Facebook, Google, wherever, they constantly posted about their meetings. And I just, I thought, you don't do that until you've got the deal. Mm. You know, and that was my first meeting. But I remember when I eventually told them that I had flown over that week for the meeting, they were appalled. Because, I mean, I told them years later, why would you do that? I'm like, you said you were available on Thursday. You're the Grammys. Mm. And they're like, but you flew all that way. I said, yeah, but I did 15 other meetings. It's okay. You know, it, yeah. was, it, was, it was great, You've, but there's a lot of smoke and mirrors, I think, to begin with. You've got to make sure that you are available and if you can, you know, jump on a plane and go over. That FaceTime is really, really critical because there's a, a thing that happens when you meet a person called retina lock. And now that we've, when we met, you know, a couple of weeks ago, and I was so excited to meet you, but when we met, what happens is you, your brain and my brain effectively get downloads of the other person. Mm. So for, forever now, whenever we communicate with each other, whether it's email, text, whatever it may be, you'll always know what I'm trying to say to you and the, and the tone with which I'm saying it to you because you've met me and we have that, that code download of each other, if you will. So that face You don't think that's available on a screen? It's not the same. Mm. Because on a screen, you're seeing this much of a person. If I'm in a meeting and my legs are jigging like this the whole time and you can't see that <laughs> on a screen, you know, it's, it, yeah. it's different. And, and I remember with the Grammys again, when I was meeting with Maureen Droney, it was the third time I'd flown over. And she said to me, we know you're serious now. This is the third time you've come to meet us in two and a half years. Your startup is still alive. The deal's happening. And I remember walking out and just bursting into tears of joy and yeah. also immense relief because it had taken, I think it was three years, five months, two days, 1,600 emails, no, two and a half, 2,852 emails and 16 meetings to get the deal done. Yeah. Well, takes time. Th th there is a pattern that goes all through your career, which is perseverance and yeah. resilience. Uh, you oh, know, you've resilience. obviously got enormous <laughs> reserves of both. It's been, the resilience has been learnt. I did not have it when I started this. I had a, a different level of, of resilience to what I have now. Right. It's my, I mean, when, honestly, I think when I started this journey, I felt like I had rice paper thin skin and now um, it's not that I can't be hurt by things, I, I, I can, and I can be knocked down, but I definitely get up in much faster than I did in the past. But, um, but yeah, in the beginning, gosh, no, it was really, 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 really hard. Yeah. And now I'm, I'm like, oh, okay, all right, all right. Well, we'll keep moving on, you know. So we should wrap this up, but I, I have one last question for you, which is, you must have had some incredible mentors along the way. Mm. What's the best bit of career advice, or just advice generally, that you've, you've had? Oh, my gosh. Ah, oh, wow. Gosh, there's been so... There's been so much, but I, I think something my mum has always said too, but for, for quite a few of my mentors, their whole thing has been never, ever, 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 ever give up. You have to... You have to take the criticisms. It's really incredibly important because that's how you learn, as long as they're constructive and they're not just to be hurtful. Mm. But just never give up. And sometimes what you think you're going to do might change, but that's okay. That's all part of the process. You just have to keep going and keep at it. And sometimes during the journey, it does get hard and you do get knocked down. And every now and then, you need Netflix and a tub of Ben and & Jerry's <laughs> and you need to cry it out 
or I have in the past, and that's been okay too, but it, give yourself a day and the next day back on the horse. You just gotta keep going. It's really, really, really important to keep going. Because you, uh, you never really relax, right? Like there's no. never a point where you go, <laughs> woohoo, I'm successful now. Does it, it, you haven't reached that point, presumably. Every time we have a win, again, my, our beautiful chair, LJ, um, said to me, we had, a, we had a win earlier in the year, and she said, now, Jax, are you celebrating this tonight with Louis? And I said, yes. <laughs> and she said, that's not very convincing. I said, no, LJ, I promise you. She said, you've got to celebrate this, darling, because tomorrow we have more work to do. And it, it's true, like you, you work towards something for so long, you achieve it, it's really exciting. And then for me, the immediate thing that happens is this tsunami wave comes into my brain of like, okay, now we have to do this, 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 and this. So you're just constantly adding to your stream of deliverables and milestones. So, uh, yeah, I, I, it, I, I think I have all of these ideas in my head of what success for Jackster is going to look like. But to be honest, I probably need to stop and take stock of where we're at now and acknowledge that, you know, we've done really well. Job's not over yet, but my God, you know, we've done really well. Yeah. Good point to leave it. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you, mate. And please thank Jackie. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, thank you for coming to AIM. And uh, thanks all of you at home. Thank you, mate.